Awesome. Uh, we're in this series that we've titled Love Like Jesus. And I'd like to invite you all to open your, your notes. It's, they're right there in your bulletin as we follow along the message for today. Uh, when we talk about love, when we talk about people, there's a lot of things that are society values. One of those things that society values is beauty. Beauty. When somebody who is beautiful enters a room, people look. Another thing that society values is money. Money. We uh, have magazines that tell us the richest people in the world. Because somehow we care. We care how much people make. Another thing that we value is athletic ability. If you like sports, you may be a fan of a team or a fan of a player, right? Like when LeBron came to the Lakers, first you hated him, now you love him, you know? Another thing that we value is fame. Fame. We have complete magazines talking about how famous people are. We know where they are. We know what they do. We know where they come from. We know who they're married to. We know what they had for lunch because we follow on Instagram. We want to know about people. The crazy thing about all these things is that maybe it happened to you. When you were in high school or as you are in high school, you were standing next to someone who is famous in school, popular. Somebody who is in athletics and other kids come and they talk to that person and you appear to be invisible. Maybe it happens in your work. Maybe it even happens within your family when everybody gets together over the holidays. Because there seems to be always someone who is overlooked. There seems to be always someone who is invisible. In fact, we have a name for that. And the name comes out of a notebook. Remember when you were in school and you had those notebooks that you used to put in your trapper keeper? Remember those? You don't remember? You do remember. It was like a binder that you put your stuff in, it's lit and had a cover. Some of you are like, oh yeah, I remember that. Well, the paper that you used to write on, on the left side, has a line, a, horizontal, a, a vertical line that runs from the top to the bottom. Remember that? You know how that line is called? It's a margin. So that line, that margin is designed for you to write all over to the right. Nothing to be written on the left. Because if you write outside on the left side, you're writing outside of the margin. And see, in society, we have people who are outside of the margin. In fact, we have a name for that, and they're called marginalized. These are the invisible people, the ones that get overlooked, the ones that are, are outside. See, Jesus came to this world to teach us how to love, but not just that. He showed us how to love even those who were outside of the margins. You see, I, I heard somebody say at one time that Jesus came to, to work outside of the margin, but I don't think so. I think that Jesus came to move the margin. And if you open your notes, let's see what the Bible teaches us about loving those who are outside of the margins. In James chapter 2. By the way, this James is the brother of Jesus. So he kind of learned a little bit about his brother. He learned a little bit of how he loved. And notice what it says, verse uh, 12, chapter 2 of James. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. And up to that point, we're okay because we know there's going to be a judgment. Amen? Amen? But we also know that there is a law. Amen? But how is it that the law will set us free? 
Because the law is designed to show when we're wrong. James continues saying in verse 13, There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. The law that will set us free is the law of mercy. And continue saying, but if you have been merciful, if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. So family, the law that we're going to face when we are judged, in essence, it's how we treated other people. Mercy. Mercy always triumphs over judgment. So if we learn to love like Jesus, we love people who even who are marginalized like Jesus loved. And that is the way in which we will be judged. The size of our God is demonstrated in the size of our love. So... How can we learn? How can we practice? How can we experience love like that? I have a few principles that I want to share with you. And these principles come out of the story that is found in Matthew chapter 20. And the first principle that I want to share with you is that Jesus taught us that we need to learn to listen. Listen. And the reason why we need to learn to listen is so that we learn how to read those Clues that indicate that people are in pain. You see, wherever Jesus went, people followed. And people followed for different reasons. Some wanted to learn about what he was teaching. Some others wanted to judge Jesus in the way he was teaching. But some others followed because somehow, in some way, they believed that by being close to Jesus, their pain might just go away. And Jesus learned to listen to those voices of pain. Jesus learned to listen to those who in any particular moment were experiencing pain and needed his healing touch. Matthew chapter 20, verse 30. Two blind men were sitting beside the road when they heard that Jesus was coming that way. They began shouting, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And you know, like it happens everywhere, right? Somebody starts screaming. There's always somebody will be next to them who will tell them, quiet, be quiet, don't scream. You know, if you've been a parent in church and you have little kids, you know how that is like. Because... Somehow, we always have the tendency to quiet down the voices of pain. Quiet. Don't say anything. But it says right here that these two men, when they heard the crowd, be quiet, they shout even louder. Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Today, we are surrounded. We are people who are in pain. We have pain because of our age. We have pain because of our gender. We have pain because of our race. We have pain because of our finances. We have, pain, we have pain because of our families. We have pain for all so many different reasons. But we are in pain. We are in pain. And society tells us, quiet. Be quiet. Don't say anything. But the gospel is not about quieting the voice of pain. The gospel is about listening to the voice of pain. And you see, what happens here is that 
Jesus understood one thing. That pain, when it's not being heard, turns into fear. And when if you turn on the TV today and, and you watch people yelling at each other in the news, it's because they fear, because they don't understand that what they need is not a political party. What they need is not some political savior. What they need is not a better economy. What they need is not a wall. But instead, what they need is a savior. And because they don't know that their pain can be transformed by the power of the Savior, their voice of pain turns into fear, and fear turns into yelling. Because that is the result of people when they're not listened to. In Proverbs 21, 13, Solomon said, those who shut their ears to the cries of the poor will be ignored in their own time of need. So if there is a thing that we need to learn, family, is that we, ne we need to learn to love like Jesus. And the first thing that Jesus taught us to do is that we need to learn to listen to those who are in pain. The second thing that Jesus does is that he stops. He stops. A and if we are to love like Jesus, family, sometimes we need to learn to stop whatever you're doing at the moment. You know, there's a book, one of my favorites, it's called The Steps of Jesus. And there's a ton of books that have talked about the, the way that Jesus moved and his, and his travels and, and places that he went. But I think that at this time, even more important than following the steps of Jesus, is learning about the stops of Jesus. Because see, every time that Jesus stopped, something amazing happened. Notice what happened in, in verse 32 in, in, in the first part. Jesus heard them, and he stopped. Jesus heard them, and he stopped. Now, let me say that again in case you didn't get it. Jesus heard them. These two blind men are on the road. They can't see, but they know that Jesus is passing by. Somehow, they acquired information that a possible help for their problems was passing by. They don't know how he looks like. They don't know who is coming with him. All they know is that Jesus has the identity, the identification, the identifiers that can make him someone special with God-given ability to turn their pain into joy. And they're claiming, they're, they're crying, they're, they're, they're yelling, Lord, Son of David. And Jesus stops. Remember, there's a crowd that is telling them, guys, guys, be quiet. Be quiet. Jesus heard this man. And he stops. I think that the number one killer of merciful acts in society is busyness. Because we are so busy, we don't have time to help people. We have crazy schedules that disable us from any merciful act because we are so concerned about our responsibilities that we are disconnected from the possibilities of being meaningful with somebody else. And now Jesus stops. Paul, uh, the apostle in Philippians chapter 2 verse 4 says, don't look out only for your own interests. Now, let, let me explain this. It says only. So it is okay to look out for your interests. It is okay. But when it becomes the only thing, it's not okay. Notice what it says. Do, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. See, God gave us an ability to, to, to work and to labor and to provide for ourselves. But if that is our only focus, if our only focus is to acquire things for ourselves, those same things that we're seeking to acquire will be our demise. But when we seek to share those things that we acquire with people who need them, Instead of being our damnation, 
will be our blessing. So Jesus, he listened. Jesus stopped. And now Jesus looks. It's kind of weird, right? He looked after he stopped. Yeah, notice. Every time that Jesus stops, he looks. And it's kind of different than the way we do it. You see, there's been times that I've been in my office, and not so much now because two of my kids are gone, but before when they were younger, I would be in my office preparing a sermon or preparing a class, being busy working. And they would come in my office, dad, 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 and I would be, yes, son. And I would kind of listen to them, but at the same time I kept doing what I was doing. I hope you've never done that before, but we'll kind of listen, but we don't look. I just read a story uh, yesterday uh, that there's this, this mother working on her cell phone. And uh, I'm just saying working on her cell phone. And, and the kid came and said, mom, mom, mom. And, and she kind of nods and responds to the kid with some words. But the kid continues to, to call the mom's attention, telling her, Mom, I want you to talk to me with your face too. And see, that is what Jesus is doing. He wants us to learn to listen with our face. In fact, there's a, a man that, that comes to Jesus. And this man, it's not the typical man that Jesus speaks to. Because, see, we, we know that Jesus uh, talked to the blind and the, uh, and the cripple and the leopard and all the people with all kinds of social troubles and health troubles. But this man is different. In Mark chapter 10, verse 21, it says that Jesus, looking at the man, felt genuine love for him. But let me tell you about this man. This man was rich. This man is used to people to come to him. And perhaps this man didn't listen to these people with his face. But now he meets Jesus. And Jesus stops and looks at him. And the reason why he looks at him and he feels this love towards him is because Jesus, as he stops and listens and looks, he realized that this man had a story. And you see, every single person, that we get in contact with, every single person that we meet has a story. You know that person that cut in front of you on the freeway? And you wave by? <laughs> they have a story. The police officer that gave you a ticket last week, he has a story. Because everyone has a story. And when we understand people's behaviors, is the only way that we can do that is when we understand their story. You don't know why the clerk at the store is so bitter. But you don't know that her husband left her. You don't know why those kids are always in the corner not talking to anyone. But you don't know their story at home. Everyone, everyone has a story. And what Jesus is teaching as family is that as we stop, we have to learn to look. And by look, another word for look here, actually in the Greek, it's more than just looking on the surface. But it's actually studying, analyzing, learning from them. Going back to the story of the blind man in, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. When he saw the crowds... Who's he? Jesus, right? When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Now Jesus does something interesting. Who were the ones calling for him? The blind man. But now Jesus, he stops. He looks at the blind man. He knows what's going on with the blind man. But now he's looking at the crowds. These people who are with him. These people who were telling the blind man, quiet. And Jesus, who knows everything. Sees the crowds and understands these guys need help. They are in pain. They need compassion themselves. And isn't it interesting 
that there's always someone who's always angry at you or acts angry? Isn't it interesting that there's always someone at work who is super obnoxious? Isn't it? Amen. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that there's always someone who's bitter? Isn't it interesting that there's always a neighbor who never says hi? I think that it's like that child. You know, when you have multiple children, you realize that as parents, as much as we try, it's very difficult to give them equal amount of attention. It is. At least it happened to me with three. I could not give them each 33.333% of my attention. I couldn't. But you know that when one of them is acting up, you know what I mean by acting up? Doing things that they know that you don't like. When that kid is doing that, there's only one reason. They're asking for attention. And usually that happens when an individual does not feel that he's fairly loved or that she's fairly loved. And as adults, we're just the same way. Just the same way. When somebody's behaving crazy at work, they need attention. When your neighbor is acting weird, they need attention. When the person that's sitting next to you at church... They need attention. <laughs> because we all need to feel that attention. And what Jesus is thinking is that everyone in the crowd needs attention. And isn't it funny that experts have said that we all have different languages for love. Some like to be touched. Some like to be talked to. Some like to receive gifts. Some, some, some like to do things for people. Some like uh, words of affirmation. And I'm sure there's more than five, but five kind of pay the bill. Because we all need to feel love at some point. And the only way that that could happen is when somebody looks at us with their face. Why do I know this? See, when you date, when you date, and you fall in love, and I wrestle with that, fall in love. It's like, oh, I can't help it. Ah. <laughs> but when you fall in love and you go out to dinner or whatever with that person, you're sitting across the table from them. There's going to be a moment when your eyes are going to meet. And when that happens, you stop talking. We're just looking at each other. No, 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 this is not a Walmart movie. It's life. Because when two people who care for each other meet at eye level, you don't have to say words. That moment gets frozen in time. And that, that is why it becomes special. Because when you look at someone with compassion with love that is the only result and that is exactly what Jesus is telling us we need to learn how to look at people with love with compassion Proverbs 14 21 says it is a sin to belittle one's neighbor Blessed are those who help the poor. Everyone has a story. Everyone. So when we criticize someone for their behavior, we don't know, without knowing their story, it's us who have a problem. But when we stop, when we listen, when we look, we learn their stories. Then we'll act with compassion. And the next thing that Jesus does, family, is that he asks. 
We need to learn to ask people what they need because we oftentimes assume, oh, this is, what this is what they need. You know, it's funny when, when another person comes to you as a parent, especially when you have little kids, and tells you, you know, what your children need. Right? You know, w when I became a pastor, I had no kids. In fact, for three years of my ministry, I have no kids. And, and while I was a youth pastor and I was working with kids, I developed three theories about raising children. But after I had my three children, I had no theories. <laughs> because nobody understands what parenting a child today is, unless you're a parent today. Our children today are going through things and experiencing things that we never dreamed that we were going to experience. In fact, we're not even equipped to deal with some of those things. I've always thought of myself as a techie guy. I studied computer science. My youngest kid hasn't even finished high school and he knows about, more about computers than I do. It's like it comes now in their DNA. You know, you see a little kid and the first thing they do when they see a flat thing is... <laughs> Have you seen them? Who taught them? Who taught them? You know, when we saw a flat thing, we usually went like this. Or we just looked at it. We never thought, I'm going to go like this. <laughs> but see, things are different today. So when we look at people, we cannot assume that we understand them, that we know exactly what they need. Jesus taught us that what he did, and, and let me remind you, this is Jesus. He knows a, two or a thing or two. He asked this man, this man, what do you need? No, look, look at verse 32, rather in your notes. When Jesus heard them, he stopped and called, what do you want me to do for you? And we could say, well, they were blind, duh. But no, no. Because see, a lot of people, they don't even understand their pain themselves. I, I, when I read this text, I'm thinking, what if they wanted to cross the road? They're blind, they can't see, right? If they said, well, we need to get to the other side. Maybe Jesus said, okay, hold my arm, I'll take you over. We cannot assume that because someone is in a situation, we know exactly what they need. We need to learn to ask. What do you want me to do for you? And these people responded. I mean, these men responded correctly. We want to see. We want to see. And, and that takes us to the next principle. And it's pretty self-explanatory. Because after we listened, after we stopped, after we looked, and after we asked, gets what's next. We have to do. We have to do. Nothing says I love you more than doing some thing for someone that needs it. If you give $100 to somebody who is wealthy, $100 mean nothing. But if you give $100 for someone who does not have enough money to eat, $100 mean everything. So nothing says love than more than doing something for someone who needs it. Do what you can to help. Verse 24. Jesus felt sorry for them and touched their eyes. Instantly, they could see. Once they could see, it says right there on the text, what did this man do? They followed him. They followed him. These men were in darkness, in darkness. And after they were in darkness, once they could see, Jesus showed them the light, then they could see. Now, I know what you're thinking, but pastor, you got to be kidding me. I'm not Jesus. I could not return sight to any blind people. But there's people 
around you who need a little bit of light. Let me share with you a couple of examples. There's people around you who need help. There's always someone who needs help in a difficult time. Someone, an elderly person who lives by your house who needs help with the yard or the trash or picking up something in front or taking their bags into the house after they come from the market. There's always someone who needs help. But see, because we are busy and we're not listening, and we don't stop, we don't look, they become overlooked. They become marginalized. They become invisible. But once we learn to pay attention to our surroundings, to the people who are living around us, we will find those who need help. There's also people who are lonely. People who are lonely. It is amazing, the statistics show us that in our country, with so many ways to connect with people, so many places to attend, so many clubs, so many churches, there are still thousands of people that check loneliness as one of their issues. I'm sure that you work with one. I'm sure that you live near one. I'm sure that you know one. But you haven't identified them yet because you haven't stopped to listen. There's also grieving people. And this is difficult because if you are like me, see, I make my living talking. But when I have to minister to someone who is grieving, I don't know what to say. But there's something that I can do. I can be there for them. And that is the thing that we have to learn to do. To be with those who are grieving. Your presence will be more valuable than any words that you can say. There's also people who are defeated. Those who need to... A second chance to life. Those who, who, who try to, to make a career and they lost their job. Those who, 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 who try to, to grow a family and they lost it. Those who, who, who had plans, visions for their life. And, and all they have right now is empty hands and empty pocketbooks. I'm sure you know one of two. Be with them. Talk to them. Help them to understand that they are worthy of a second chance. And also, the angry. I don't know if you noticed, but I went from the easy one to the hardest one. Angry people. See, the thing about love is that Love cannot be filtered. Love cannot be categorized. And we have to learn to love even those who are members of our family. Yeah, I said that. Because oftentimes the most difficult people to love are those who are closer to us and made us angry. Those who did something to us. But oftentimes they haven't even realized that they did something to us. We just, oh man, I cannot be with him. After what he did, and he's like, hey, how you doing? He's like, not as good as I should. <laughs> they don't even know. But there was always, there will always be angry people. Angry people that will tell other people, be quiet. But they also need to be loved. So family, as we learn to love like Jesus. Let's not miss the opportunity to listen, to stop, to look, to ask, and to do. Because there will always be those who are calling for someone 
to show them the light.